Hello, everyone. I see some people still coming in. If everyone could take a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and welcome everyone to today's panel discussion focused on scale up, creating an enabling environment. My name is Vicki Hausman. I'm a partner with Dahlberg Global Development Advisors, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. We have four exciting panelists with us. Uh, three exciting panelists, one who unfortunately sends his regrets. Um, unfortunately, Eddie McCoyo couldn't join us today. Um, but we have Hayo uh, von Bema from Text to Change, Sarah Emerson from the CDC Foundation and the M Health Country Partnership, and last but not least, Garrett Mel from WHO. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to just briefly share a few reflections and set some context and frame for today's um, speakers and then the, the time that we'll have at the end for some open Q&A. Uh, thinking back on previous M Health summits, and I look around the room and see many familiar faces and know uh, gr a great number of us have been to several of these in past years. And the topic of scale is, is not a new one. It's one that's been talked about for several years now. And, um, looking back over the past five years or so, the majority of M Health deployments have been pilots, and there's been an ongoing dialogue about the need for scale. Um, but few actually make it to either national or regional scale. There's been a lot of positive momentum. So on the books, at least, there are more and more countries and national governments that are setting e-health strategies, um, but there's some some variability uh, in terms of how established those are and how robust those are. And similarly, there have been individual deployments um, and the efforts of our panelists today in moving from pilot towards a growing user base um, and starting to move into greater scale. There are a range of challenges in the enabling environment, uh, many of which I'm sure we'll hear about today, be it policy, financing, capacity, um, or design, all of which create challenges in terms of scale. And one statistic I just wanted to share briefly, um, when we looked in a study last year that Dahlberg conducted at financing for M Health, historically 85% of funding was going to early stage R&D or pilots, uh, with very little funding available to move beyond the pilot stage into more of a growth phase and towards maturity and scale. If you contrast that even conceptually with something like you'd see in more traditional entrepreneurial spaces like a Silicon Valley, um, the startup capital is actually much smaller scale than the growth capital and the, the capital for scale um, that lies beyond pilots. So clearly a, a lot of work to be done, um, and this is just one illustration of enabling environment constraints. I'm sure we'll hear about many more constraints and opportunities from our panelists today. So with that context, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, Hayo, um, who will talk to us about his work underway. Hayo. Hi, thanks uh, for having me here. Um, challenges. Um, well, they're great to talk about, but uh, I mean, today is also about uh, the great opportunities that the M Health, M Health has. Um, been around in the space for a couple of years now. Uh, we're celebrating our uh, fifth year of implementing M Health campaigns in, um, in Africa uh, this February. So, um, yeah, been around for, for a couple of, couple of years now, and we've seen a lot change. M Health in itself, I mean, I can remember the first M Health Summit here in D.C. in, uh, in 2009. Uh, where it was all about pilots, and, and, and uh, we called it pilotitis at that point. It was the biggest disease in M Health, and um, what we've seen scale throughout the years. I mean, especially in the in the number of conferences and the number of people attending conferences. I mean, if you go downstairs now in the exhibition hall, I mean, I'm I'm afraid of even going in. I'm, it's the the Disney World of M Health at this point, um, and it's 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 awesome. I mean, it's amazing that. Uh, that uh, the ML space has picked up this, this much speed. Uh, but it's also giving us some thoughts about where we went, where we came from, and, um, and where this field is ending. 
Uh, from my perspective, um, working for um, a fairly small uh, NGO based out of uh, the Netherlands and Uganda uh, called Tech to Change, our biggest scale has been on an organizational level, I will be honest with you. We have implemented something of over 60 small, semi-large and some large AM health campaigns. Um, but, I mean, for me, the focus has always been on the organizational level. How do you scale an organization implementing M health campaigns? Uh, but I will take you through some of our campaigns as well, the challenges, and I think, well, I won't exactly give you the ingredients on, uh, on how to scale, but let's see if we can get there uh, one pace at a time. Um, emerging markets. It's the only thing I know. I mean, we're here in the sea, of, uh, of course, and there's a lot going on here in the domestic markets and in Euro Europe a bit as well. But my expertise really lies in how to implement, design, and execute good M health campaigns in, um, in Africa. We have some work in South America, but as we've seen in the statistics, the majority of the programs are still running in, uh, in Africa. Oh, let me go back a bit. Um, this is like just a basic uh, Google Trends. Uh, um, it's skipping. Uh, um, so w what is happening with M Health? This is just if you type in M Health in Google on what the trend has been for the last couple of years, and what you see is that all the people that actually issue queries into Google on M Health, they're based out of the U.S. and in Europe. The bigger part of the M Health campaigns are actually being implemented in Africa. But in Europe and the U.S., we talk about it, and actually people in Africa don't even know sometimes that they're involved with an M-Health campaign. So basically the word M-Health has a little bit of a, of a hype inside it as well. This is the, the Gardner hype cycle, and um, I think we really started in 2007, 2008, with all the expectations we had, just trying to get back once in a while, it's ahead of me or saying that I'm not talking fast enough, and I'm not sure. Let's see if this can stop one way. Um, and we've seen really the peak of inflated expectations over the last couple of years. I mean, M-Health was going to be the silver bullet, the one tool that was going to solve every health problem around the world. And it actually isn't yet. So we're going down the line a bit at this moment, and I think next year is not going to be the year of scale yet for the majority of the organizations and M-Health campaigns but we're going to uh, a very disillusioned part. And that's, that's the best thing about um, setting up campaigns, about being entrepreneurial, about, be, about pioneering. I mean, the disillusionment is good. It's actually teaching you what works and what doesn't. So don't be afraid about the fact if a part of this M Health space is going to fall down a bit. I'm really having trouble with this clicker, but let's see if this works for you. Um, and we'll see that 2014 will be the, the, the year where you actually see a lot of the, the slope of alignment where actually scale is going to be. What I talked about it a little bit earlier is organizational scale versus program scale. So actually from text to change point of view, the majority of our campaigns are sometimes very small. They're just being funded, like what Vicky also told us, with a, with a grant that actually doesn't have scale embedded into it. And even the definition on scale is differ, difficult. Um, discussed it this morning as well with a friend, and it's more about scalability, about having the ambition to scale up your program one way or another. Sometimes you're not exactly sure if it's going to happen or if it's, even if the environment is going to be good, but really making sure your design at first has the scalability option in it is the biggest part of whatever you're going to do. So bear in mind, if you want to scale up your M Health campaign, if it's in the US, if it's in Europe, if it's in Asia or in Africa, it's about ambition. It's not about technology. It's not about uh, uh, how much funding you will have because if you will prove scale, funding will follow. And the only thing we've seen successfully scaling from our perspective in campaigns is through partnerships. So never go alone. If you really want to have scale, want to have an ambitious program on M Health, work together. It's the only success factor I can tell you. It's not like you have ambition, partnership, add water, and you have a scalable M health campaign, but it's a great start. We scale a lot with quantitative measurements. So we, we have some great campaigns on the CDC, which Sarah will talk more about, um, some really nice ones with FHI uh, 360 as well. 
uh, which have a great amount of numbers of people really accessing our mobile health uh, uh, systems in Africa. Uh, especially a country like Tanzania now is, is really up to speed with, uh, with the implementation of a lot of uh, um, health campaigns. But it's never alone, and we really put in a great effort on getting the quality back into a lot of RM health campaigns as well. I mean, at first, if you're really getting the stress from uh, either donors or industry on scaling, you will lose quality. And that's very dangerous if you're in the, um, in the health field, which this is still about. So bear in mind, if you're going for quantitative scale for the press release where you state that you've just reached a billion people in 20 seconds, quality. It's about quality in the end. So celebrating today, of course, is not only that uh, Texas Change has been here for a couple of years now and that we've seen uh, the M Health Summit really scale. Um, it's about celebration that 20 years ago the text message was invented. I think it's one of the most stupid inventions ever. I mean, it's a technology which is totally crazy. Uh, it was invented by a guy, and I, I, f I think they, they shouldn't have a, a statue for him whatsoever. I mean, it's 160 characters. Um, the costs are very high on an individual level. Only if you work on it on a large scale, you can actually uh, uh, use it in a more cost-effective way. But it works. It works all around the world. It works on every mobile phone. And as mo most of you know, I mean, the majority of all mobile phones at this point are not longer in the U.S. and in uh, Europe. They're in emerging markets. In emerging markets, so in Africa, like 75% of the population there has access to a mobile phone. Not a smartphone yet. I mean, we're not in the iPhone phase or everybody with an Android. Um, so text message and voice is like a great way to go forward at first to start it. After that, the apps will come, the iPads will come, and the rest will, uh, will follow. These are some figures about text messages, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's still growing, um, and like I said, the technology is, uh, is really stupid. It's got a lot of limitations, but if you be, you're very creative with it, and you're a good designer, I think from our perspective, um, about 15% of our time goes into technology, and the rest is blood, sweat, and tears around really designing the content. I mean, that's the only thing we really try to focus on. If you have good content, people will like your, your, your technology whatsoever. It's about content in the end. We're a small organization, started in 2007, first in 2008 with our uh, initial campaign. 2009 and 2010 were terrible. I think we went bankrupt like two or three times maybe. <laughs> Put, put in our own money and, uh, and start it all over again. Um, so scale is, is, of course, it's, uh, it's um, I can still remember the early days. Uh, my colleague Bas, uh, our co-founder here as well as in, in, in the room, and uh, we had a lot of discussions on whether or not we should continue. And at this moment, it's more time for us to celebrate the fact that it's easier to get M health campaigns to run in Africa. Um, basically, scale is sometimes a surprise as well. We run a lot of the same campaigns all over again, and suddenly something happens. This is an essential uh, campaign we did with FHI 360, which is still running in uh, Tanzania, where sometimes the numbers are, are, are just okay. It's like 10,000 people, 20,000 people will opt into a text message campaign, and then certainly there's a huge problem. You have like 130,000 people suddenly texting. So this actually happened this year, but a lot of challenges and a lot of celebrations, of course, about the fact that without us really knowing what happened, because I'm very honest about that, with some good campaigns and good content, content that has been designed for over a year and a half or two years, then you suddenly hit the scale. So still, in partnerships, good content, don't focus on technology, be ambitious, and be there for the, for the long term. And health, and if you want to be there in the health field, think of it as something you will be working in, not on, on three or four years, but maybe in ten years you will still run in this field. It's one of the best things I did in my life. I'm an IT guy, always set up ICT companies, and I can assure you working in this M health field is, is far much more interesting than any other ICT application I've ever seen. Um, just wanted to go to this slide, if it's allowing me. It's not. Uh, well, yes, it is. Communications. We've seen a lot of hype about M Health, of course. Uh, we've seen all the figures, all the press releases, all the partners coming in. 
the private sector, NGOs, governments, UN, whatsoever. Um, but what actually makes it work is also making sure that whatever you're doing is being put out there in the field. So do put your M Health campaigns online. Make sure you share your lessons learned. Make sure you share technologies. It's about being open to this. At this point, Text Change also let go of its proprietary text messaging platform, which we designed in 2008, and we started to collaborate with one of our maybe biggest competitors of partners on setting up open source platforms. I mean, it's these kind of things that actually make you be able as an organization and on a campaign level to be there for the long run as well. So do be open on technology, be open on content, and then eventually the partnerships will follow. Um, partnerships such as what I said, the biggest one we've seen so far are sometimes granted from governments. It's a great way of starting. It's like what I said with CDC, FHI 360, with ISCD out of the Netherlands. These are the bigger uh, consortium that actually are able to scale these M Health campaigns. And not only because of the funding that is being combined, but because of the knowledge, ambition, and in the end, the end goal. That we're still here in 10 years working and improving ourselves in this M Health field. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you next year as well and, uh, and, and hope to hear all your stories about your M Health uh, experiences. So I think still there are a lot of challenges there to be, but I mean the opportunities are even bigger. So uh, let's also uh, yeah, make that a celebration day on the 20th birthday of the text message. Thank you. Thank you, Hayo. Our next speaker is Sarah Emerson from the CDC Foundation. Sarah? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Excellent. Well, I'd like to say we fixed the problem with the remote. Apparently, we're not supposed to touch it. So we'll, we'll see how that works. Um, again, let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Sarah Emerson, and I'm working with the CDC Foundation in uh, the capacity as the country manager for the M Health Tanzania Public Private Partnership. Uh, before we, we go ahead and uh, share with you a little bit of information about some of our programs. Wow, I actually didn't touch it. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'd like to do prior to that, without touching anything. All right. This is going to be an interesting uh, activity. Um, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and acknowledge uh, some of the, the different members of the Tanzanian delegation that we have with us this year. Uh, we have uh, uh, several esteemed colleagues from the Tanzania Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. Dr. Wanani, who is the national coordinator of the Safe Motherhood Initiative, and you'll be hearing out about a program that he's been championing in Tanzania. Uh, I'd also like to uh, highlight Dr. Mwendo Mwenesi. Some of you may have just come from her presentation. She's the National M Health Coordinator, also in the Ministry of Health uh, and Social Affairs in Tanzania, as well as Mr. Rabona, who is uh, the Acting Director of the Department of Policy and Planning and Monitoring and Evaluation. So if you have a chance, uh, please do come by our booth and uh, meet these colleagues from Tanzania, as well as we have colleagues from Kenya working in the M Health Kenya Partnership, and my colleagues with the CDC Foundation who are here today. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, try this. I do apologize because there's an infinite amount of animation. I have violated every rule of effective PowerPoints. And uh, I think this is the reason they tell you not to use animation days like today, so I do apologize in advance. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a brief introduction of the, wow, of the partnership. I'm actually not touching it. Um, highlight some of the opportunities and challenges that we see as scaling, as well as provide some examples through our experience in Tanzania. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Mendo Manessi is M Health Coordinator at the Ministry of Health and uh, Social Welfare, and we are co-chairs co of the M Health Partnership in Tanzania. And I have some video links from her, uh, and she'll be sharing uh, remotely here, or not. Excuse me, excuse me, audiovisual person. Hello, hi. Is it is it possible to get a laptop? Because this controller isn't working. Okay, thanks. Apologize for this. If I could advance the slide, I would go ahead and continue. Let's see if it works. I 
just is jumping around on it, so I'm not touching anything. Okay. Yeah, it's changing slides. Well, maybe I'll just go ahead and, and uh, just introduce the partnership without the slides, if you'll allow me. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the MLF Tanzania partnership is a public private partnership. I'm sorry, can't hear me. Okay. Uh, is a public-private partnership, and it is co-led by the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. This is rather exciting. The Ministry of Health uh, is working, as this slide is uh, attempting to tell you, is working to um, get out into the, the more remote areas, um, in particular folks that are underserved, communities that are underserved. And one key way that they're doing this in Tanzania is by utilizing the mobile phone. Can you go to the next slide? Oh, okay. And the next one, please. And just leave it. Up. Oh, let me go back. Best laid plans. Um, all right, I think we're going to have to continue. Um, so uh, I'll just mention briefly, unless this is, yeah. All right, well, if you're able to uh, stay focused on what I'll present rather than the slides. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a public-private partnership, and the Ministry of Health is, is co-leading it, which we think has been uh, a key in making it an effective partnership. Uh, we were originally founded in 2009, uh, sort of rebranded from uh, a previous program called Phones for Health. I'll just mention um, our key objectives is in focusing on scaling and sustaining national programs. And uh, maybe I'll just get into, I won't be able to uh, have memorized all of the key components within uh, what I've said was important in scaling. Um, some that I won't be speaking in detail to would include uh, infrastructure. Um, clearly, in a country, in order to go to national scale, there does need to be the, the uh, appropriate infrastructure. Another key component that I will not speak to in detail, um, however, that I believe Garrett will touch on and that there will be opportunities potentially through some dialogue at the end of the discussion, is around data standards and interoperability. Again, I think a lot of these types of strategies are going to be important to have worked out in advance. Is this working? No. It's, it's not working. No. <clears throat> Woohoo! All right, here we go. We work on leveraging the mobile booming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, so at least now you see there are some pictures. Um, again, focused on leveraging the infrastructure that is quite strong in Tanzania, which is the mobile phone infrastructure. It is the strongest infrastructure, far better than the roads and power, et cetera. As I mentioned, we're, we're focused on sustainable and scalable programs with specific focus on creating uh, programs that increase evidence-based planning and decision-making as well as increasing public health awareness. We have one program, a blood donor messaging system. It's very expensive to recruit new donors in Tanzania, so there's a focus on utilizing the phone in order to retain existing donors. I'd be happy to answer questions or provide more information at our booth. There's another program that is being scaled nationally that's called the Electronic Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response. And this is a program that's supported across several different areas of the ministry that I'll provide more information on uh, in just a moment. And a program I'll speak quite a bit about, uh, we actually just reached 60 billion registrants in 20 seconds. Uh, no, we actually did today, though. This is the 13th day that we've been live with this program at a national scale, and we actually did just pass the 20,000 uh, registration mark of active participants. There's been about 40 who have registered and are not active, and uh, 13 days in, we're at 20,000. Um, this is a national campaign, Wazazini Pendeni in Swahili, means love me parents, and it's a campaign positioned uh, as the unborn baby or the newborn baby, asking the parents and really the broader community that is the, the family unit within Tanzania to take care of that baby. So here are some uh, different factors, again, that I mentioned. There's a question around priorities. Whose priorities are we following in the country? Local country ownership and leadership. Is there a strategy defined from the beginning? 
partnerships, as Hayo talked about, I'd like to discuss in more detail there. A collaborative environment, creating an environment where collaboration is fostered and encouraged in mHealth. Trying to figure out the puzzle of sustainable financing, this is going to be another important uh, topic. I won't be able to speak in detail about any key successes we've had, but can share with you some of the opportunities that we see. The infrastructure, which I mentioned, as well as data standards. A key focus, though, again, um, having the honor to speak on behalf of my colleagues at the Ministry of Health, is to focus on the results and, and looking at programs that will be sustained and scaled that actually have an impact on improving public health. So there's a question of priorities. I think this is going to be a key factor in bringing uh, programs to scale at a national level. There are clearly going to be competing priorities, um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but there is a question about what are the country's priorities. And I think this is a fundamental question to ask when initiating any program that you do intend to take to scale. Again, transferring that country ownership to the local government and ensuring that there's uh, country ownership and leadership in the initiatives. I'd like to provide some examples here with Dr. Mwendo, if the video works, uh, around the Wazazi Nipendeni campaign, which is, again, a program that is led by the Ministry of Health out of the uh, Department of Reproductive and Child Health Services. You see there is supposed to be a video. All right, well, that's not going to work. So I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about what the campaign is. Um, it's actually a national multimedia campaign, and I will uh, give a quick overview of all the different partners involved. But as Hayo mentioned, um, the idea is to have an integrated campaign. It's great that we've had 20,000 registrants, but that has not been done without significant attention on media. And as he pointed out in his pre presentation, a very well-developed communication strategy. To give you a sense of the magnitude of the national media campaign that we're a part of, there's 28,000 radio ads scheduled in the next six months alone, 6,000 TV spots, 30,000 posters, and 120,000 uh, tools for health facility workers as far as birth planning. So this is an example of one of the posters. And here's some examples of the health facility posters. This is just uh, to highlight here, not to throw up a lot of lists, but these are all the different areas across the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare that are now involved in this campaign. It started out as a six-month malaria-focused program, uh, trying to help prevent malaria with pregnant women. And again, slowly by slowly, you'll see later that it expanded. And as you can see here with FHI 360's assistance, the Ministry Family Planning Unit, it now includes family planning, nutrition, and a variety of other topics. Going back to the point around supporting what are the priorities within a country and the country ownership, the program was Azini Pandeni supporting the broader national Karmat campaign, which is the campaign for accelerated reduction of maternal and newborn death in Tanzania. Now, this is a national campaign that President Kikwete actually launched more than a year ago. So this is sort of operationalizing that first key component of, of Karmat, again, integrating into that and helping support a broader initiative. The SMS messaging, which I'll speak to in a moment, which is what we're working on with Text to Change, with FHI 360 and several other partners, I see in the audience, is then supporting that Wazazi Nipaneni campaign. It's an SMS service for expectant women, supporters of expectant women, mothers of newborn babies, supporters of mothers of newborn babies, and people interested in safe and healthy pregnancy. Out of the 20,000 active registrants, currently about 50% are, are the very last category there, information seekers. So we see that there is a demand for this interest, even though that those who are registering are not registering as currently pregnant or supporting a pregnant person or with a newborn baby. The way the message schedule works is that when someone registers, whether it's the woman or a supporter, so a friend, a family member, a partner, uh, they will enter the current week or month of the woman's pregnancy, and receiving approximately four messages per week. As I mentioned, you can see the broad uh, variety of different information messages. And one key point to point out here is that by having the ministry really lead this effort and own this effort, uh, what we were able to do is leverage the MAMA messages, the Maternal Alliance, uh, excuse me, the Mobile Alliance for Maternal Action. We were able to leverage those messages, but what the Tanzanian government said is HIV and transmission of HIV to unborn children is a real problem in our country. And also, there's a lot of ignorance around family planning. So you can see here that there's two categories of messages that are not currently included in MAMA. And this was specifically because of the request made by the Tanzanian government. 
again, this is in looking at ensuring that this is meeting the, the team's priorities, the country's priorities, and here's our happy health facility worker who's saying this campaign is helping get my patients actually to the clinic and on time. Partnerships, which I've mentioned a little bit about, I'll just highlight some of the key success factors in having effective partnerships so far based on our lessons learned. One is knowing who you're talking to across the table and really being clear on the angle that they're coming from and looking always for mutually beneficial relationships and outcomes. Uh, I know we hear a lot about win-win, but we do feel if you're looking for sustainable scaled partnerships, then you do need to understand what the other party across the table needs out of the relationship and ensuring that they are in fact getting that. I think having realistic expectations going in, um, in particular in a donor-funded or donor-inspired uh, funding cycle and budgeting cycle where we have maybe 12 months or 14 months, 16 months uh, budget horizons. Um, you know, this is definitely a challenge but can be overcome by setting expectations early. Partnerships take a lot of time to cultivate. We're seeing around 14 to 16 months on average from seeing a concept go into some sort of an initial implementation. And also the idea of being flexible. While understanding what other partners need out of the relationship, there is a need to be flexible and go into plan B and C and sometimes we've even come to plan Z. So this is now the full list of partners. That's with Wazazini Pandemi campaign. Again, starting as a six-month malaria program has now grown uh, into providing a significant amount of coverage and free SMS information across a broad variety of areas. A way that we've leveraged the partnerships in particular on the text messaging side is that there has been the self-enrollment by texting the word Toto, which means child. But through collaboration, through partnerships, as we are technically a team of four in country, uh, we've been able to actually now start in 250, actually, excuse me, 350 health facilities in Tanzania where the health facility workers, part of the routine antenatal clinic visit, will offer assistance to help register the women as well as give them promotional materials and encourage their, their partners to register when they get home. Uh, we think this is, again, going to be very interesting to see how well it works. And there is interest with the Ministry of Health to evaluate uh, starting in January and then look at scaling that in all of their antenatal clinic visits. Again, creating a collaborative environment, and I'll just wrap up in about two minutes because I know we've uh, lost some time. Um, see if this video works. I guess not. Baby guy saying no. Um, so a point I'll mention here, um, if I can get back to the slide. Uh, around collaborative environment, as I think Tanzania is quite unique in the ministry's leadership in creating a community of practice. And anyone can be a member of the community of practice so long as they're interested in or supporting some sort of mHealth activities within the country. It is a Google group. We'd be happy to give you the Google group address if you come by our booth. Uh, again, just look for the CDC Foundation in the, in the uh, program. And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly just looking at addressing fi um, financing mechanisms. And here, this is an incomplete puzzle, as you can see, simply because I don't want to say that we have all the answers yet. Uh, I think we've learned some lessons, though. I think we can see some challenges are when there is a siloed funding approach. For example, in this case, looking at very disease-specific uh, funding. And the opportunity, then, to pool the resources. One example we have in pooling the resources is with the Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response System, where we've been able to work not only with epidemiology, which would generally own an IDSR, an Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response, but also with the National Malaria Control Program, getting funding from another donor, different funding source, as well as with GIZ and the Germans looking at uh, helping to improve and address pandemic preparedness by strengthening health systems. A note around working with the private sector we think is worth um, being very direct about is that if you're going to work with the private sector and you're looking for national scale solutions, they need to make money. And coming to the table with that in mind and starting with a very open and transparent discussion around that can often help in reaching that agreement and getting to that scale much earlier on. Long-term strategy, I think there's questions around do you need to start out with a long-term strategy? I think Kyle's point that at least having that opportunity that it is scalable and extensible, potentially if that's what your program is doing, is, uh, is a good approach to take. But certainly we've seen that looking towards the long term from the beginning can help uh, in some of the strategic decision making early on. 
And I'll end uh, discussing around looking long-term strategy and understanding total cost of ownership. Just to throw this concept out there that when looking for national scale, have very um, direct conversations from the beginning with all the stakeholder groups around total cost of ownership in year one through ten potentially. And that can help in creating programs, designing them from the beginning that actually can be scaled uh, to a national level. Again, bringing it back to, and I uh, will thank you for your time, focusing on the results and ensuring that the programs do have results and impact and improve public health, and these will motivate the country programs and, uh, again, the, the private sector and different partners to, to bring these programs to scale if they're showing that they work. So, It means good health close to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And our final speaker for today is Garrett Mel from the WHO. Hi. I'm crossing my fingers, it'll work. <laughs> Actually, I've got the simplest slides of all, I think, uh, black and white and no animation. So um, let's see how it works. Um, so um, I'm going to, uh, thanks. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience that we've um, been having with uh, a number of projects um, that are grantees of a program that was initiated um, by the UN Innovations Working Group uh, for Women's and Children's Health. And um, it's a program that is um, in partnership with uh, NORAD as well as the M Health Alliance and WHO. And it aims to identify innovations, not just in mobile technology, but uh, more broadly in financing and, and, and other domains um, toward the achievement of, of uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, the grant mechanism offers funding, technical assistance, and, and joint learning opportunity to organizations with M Health interventions that are ready to scale up. Uh, but it also uh, provides technical ex uh, expertise as well as um, uh, sort of a joint learning, a fostering of work across projects. And this is um, er an area that, that WHO helps, um, helps with um, eight projects this year, and there's a new cohort of eight projects um, this coming year. Good. Um, the projects were identified, um, actually there was a, a request for proposals and projects submitted, and it was on the basis of a number of different criteria that they were reviewed, and uh, part of it was the fact that they had a, a public-private partnership, they had a business model, um, however nascent, um, they had a demonstrated effect on maternal and child health, and uh, they had an, an a plan for not only scale-up but also project and, and program evaluation. Um, the, uh, we align them with a number of groups that are, um, have expertise in a, a variety of domains and, and the projects themselves uh, may have access to or they may not. And we, I, we work with them to identify the kinds of technical assistance that they need and uh, bring in those, uh, those groups to, to facilitate that discussion or facilitate the learning or facilitate the expertise and then also at an individual level um, if the projects require it or, or request it actually provide them technical assistance at the country level. So um, in a number of domains that are here, listed here. Um, the IWG project grantees have plans to reach um, nearly 1.5 million uh, mothers uh, with valued messaging and services and uh, roughly 100,000 frontline health workers and uh, roughly 10 to 16 out of the 16 projects focus on a partnership with the Ministry of Health whereas about half are, are leveraging public-private partnerships. Um, if we think about what attributes help any innovation to go to scale in, in the public health uh, field, um, it should be things that are, and, and this is from an experience of, of ExpandNet, which is a, a group um, that in, includes the WHO, um, that works outside of, of mobile technology but is, uh, is, has been looking at the, the science of scale up for a long time. Um, there are a couple of attributes, and, and those include um, that the innovation should be credible, it should be observable, relevant to the, the different uh, stakeholders that are using it. Um, it should have a relative advantage compared to other innovations. Um, it should be easy to install and use. It should be compatible with their current workflow, their current information flow, and it should be testable so they can see the results and the benefits of it. Um, so 
this is a question, I'm not, I'm not sure how often it's asked, but I, I want to just, I want to present this here. Um, scaling of what? Um, scaling of the project or the platform or the strategy? And I'm, I'm going to break these out and I'm going to do a little, this is a little geek uh, academics exercise, but I think it might, it might be helpful to illustrate that there are different pathways to scale depending on whether you're a project that consists of a specific mHealth strategy which is targeted at a particular health area and utilizes the functions of the health system for a particular use based in a particular geographic location and using one or more uh, mHealth platforms. An example of this is um, the use of, uh, of interactive alerts for vaccination coverage in Pakistan um, by IRD. And, and we can look here, um, sorry, it's a little, um, this is a, a new diagram. If the uh, Evidence Matters uh, session had been before this, I could have um, presented, uh, we could have had a base of knowledge here. But the point here is that, uh, I think this will work. There we go. Okay. So um, we have uh, health system goals and needs over here. We have um, the kinds of the continuum of care from reproductive maternal newborn child health. And, um, and then we have mHealth strategies along here. And, and this is um, really if we look at the particular things that they're doing, and in this case it's um, related to immunization and ensuring coverage of immunization. Um, we're going to look at that particular strategy. We're going to say, well, what, what is it about that project that's scaling? And they can scale in population size or in geographic parameters or in the diversity of the platform usage. So they keep on adding components to it and it, it becomes more mature or more utilized. And, and so you can see that scale up grow over time, geographically or size-wise. The platform is a different uh, type of scale-up scale uh, mechanism. And, and you can think of this as, as the, the, the Comcares, the, uh, the Motex, the, uh, a number of others, and I'm sorry if I've forgotten any of them, but, um, but it's the underlying operating system, the codes and the functions that you can leverage to deploy a particular strategy. Um, an example of that, in, at least in our grantee uh, work uh, with the IWG uh, catalytic grants, is the work of, of Demagi and Comcare. And we could, the scale up that they are uh, in pursuit of is, or, or is relevant to, to platforms, is the number of deployments. So how many different instances are there? The diversity of usage, is it only being used for immunization or is Comcare being used for uh, family planning and HIV, et cetera? And, and of course, the core number of users. So is it five health workers or is it uh, five million? Um, and so we look at this as the number of deployments going up, the diversity of deployments, and so you can see vaccination, verbal autopsy, a range of different kinds of things that you could imagine one uh, platform to be utilized for, um, or the number of users, and that's, that's, these are relevant to platform scale up. The ML strategy is, a, is, a, is an interesting one, and, and it's the kind of thing where um, we look at a particular function uh, on the phone, so uh, SMS text messaging, a particular use to inform, and a particular purpose to remind as an example um, for drug adherence, so for a particular need. And we see a lot of strategies, and we see a lot of strategies getting taken off and being deployed in a range of different platforms. And you could think of these as copycats. So there's a sufficient amount of, of uh, investment and interest in a particular strategy that a group feels that um, it should be deployed again and again and again. And we see things like SMS reminders for, for drug adherence as one of those examples, and decision support being another. Okay, and so in this case, it could either be using the same platform on, this, on the strategy scale up, or it could be a diversity of platforms. And in this case, um, uh, text messaging can be used for a, a range of different platforms, and they're built into that. So um, I want to look at how do you know whether you're going to scale, and, and, and is it just the numbers? Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that it's not just the numbers. It's more than that. It's, it's not just it, it's the growth in terms of numbers. It's the adoption in terms of the, the number of instances of deployment. It's the value that you've created across the diversity of usage, across the, the needs of the healthcare system. It's the partnerships that you've developed that HIO and others have described and in, in sort of the buy-in from partners. It's the financing. How much money do you actually have to, to, to uh, 
Um, it's also the, the, and this is again maturity, the impact that you're seeing or, or understanding from your solution, um, in the awareness in terms of brand equity, um, the number of, of users of the, uh, that are actually helping and supporting your solution, as well as the geographic um, and political area that you're, you're contained in. So these are, these are metrics that we're starting to, to think about in terms of, of mobile technology, or, and, and, and there are probably others out there that we haven't thought about. Um, when we work with the IWG grantees, um, we wanted them uh, over the last two work, uh, 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 working groups to, to think through, um, is there an end game to their solution? Do they want to continue um, deploying the solution themselves or do they want to hand off to someone else? Or do they want to partner with someone new? And, and to think about an end game is, is, is one in which um, most, most of the projects come to the IWG catalytic mechanism um, the, as uh, groups that have received grant-based support and that may be the only support they've received. Or they may have a partnership with, um, with the government but the government isn't yet doing the training or isn't yet supporting them uh, substantially in, uh, to decrease the overall cost of the project, in, in, to come back to the total cost of ownership that was just presented, um, you're trying to reduce the costs and increase the, the uptake. Um, so the grant-based support is, is really the, the one that we usually see. Um, freeware, of course, comes from the software domain, but it's, it's really the, the technology platform can be utilized for free and you're not getting any financial remuneration for it. Um, and but that but that it is being deployed it could potentially be deployed in a wide range of settings and you may not have any control over it but it's being deployed and it's it's um, it's valuable for that for that reason um, co generic commercialization is we're starting to see a number of different um, platforms in which they're providing the platform uh, in a generic form and there's no customization uh, that's possible or you would have to pay to have it customized. Uh, in this case the, the generic is the uh, the model uh, that is the, the uh, it, it's a, it, in a fairly mature state it's it has a diversity of usage and the uh, the developer of that feels fairly confident that that it can be uh, deployed in that way and scaled in that way. Whereas customized uh, commercialization we see a lot of a lot of projects um, looking to the donor community or partners to say, uh, and, and those partners say, we, we really have a particular need. Can you help work with us to customize what you have as a solution to make it relevant to our needs? Um, and this obviously brings in revenue and it, it helps in that, in that scale up. Um, end user subscription is really, we're seeing um, things like MDIL and others um, where um, they look at the, the users as uh, the clients um, as, as part of the payment and, and the revenue uh, generation. Um, and uh, government adoption being um, an interesting model that we're not yet seeing that much of, but we feel that it is uh, partly the, the future and the opportunity where a lot of the costs of training and institutionalization can be taken over by the government, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of planning, and, and there's real opportunity there to, to work with the government, and it, it will take time. Um, accepted standard practice is really the last one, and this is really a, sort of an altruistic one, and it's the idea that um, things like decision support or SMS um, for adherence to drugs is something that we actually don't maybe know who originated it and it's not necessarily branded but it's becoming widely deployed in ranges of, of different settings different platforms and it's having an impact without really any any particular organization that's controlling it and it, it's but it is being used and, and a lot of you are already um, deploying you know SMS reminders for Drug adherence is one of many examples of this. Um, but it's a standard practice that's accepted. It has potentially an evidence base or just a, an excitement base around it and, um, and may be easy to deploy because of its simplicity um, and its, in, its perceived value. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, 
Thanks so much, Garrett. So uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so I actually have one question I wanted to ask to the panel to kick us off, and then we'll open this up for some Q&A. Um, so I thought everyone did a great job of really teasing out different ways of defining scale and asking a key question of what do we actually mean by scale? Is it scale of an organization or a campaign, as Hayo pointed out? Is it getting to 20,000 users and beyond, in Sarah's example? Um, or as Garrett just framed for us, is there the scale of mHealth projects, platforms, and then strategies? And I just wanted to get the panel's opinion on, on a, a question. On this last framing of projects, platforms, and strategies, I wanted to hear from you all if you think these different three components of scale can exist in parallel or if there's actually a tension there, and if we try to build and scale these three different approaches at the same time, that we actually may end up cannibalizing some of our efforts, um, if only in, the, in a world where funding is limited and we can't do everything. Any thoughts on that? Garrett, maybe I'll turn to you first, if it's not putting you on the spot. Um, so, um, I, I, I think that, um, to, to some extent, there's, um, uh, I think that a number of different platforms can be um, uh, integrated with others, and so there's an opportunity to leverage and collaborate and, um, uh, and, and complement different, different programs. I think similarly on the strat, so, so for example, I see that um, MoTeC and ComCare um, are, are deploying in, you know, and, and one could consider them separate platforms, but they're, an open MRS is typically also brought to that as a suite. Um, similarly, um, if I think about strategies, um, I think about um, that there are a number of different vertical um, efforts that um, one project or another may have attempted, and they should be looking to others to, for the opportunity to, to say, let, let's see if we can collaborate in a way to bring these two different siloed efforts together and present them as, a, as maybe a stronger package of, of strategies that um, don't feel like they're siloed and, and, and pilot. Uh, and so there's an opportunity there to work together and gain scale. So I haven't really thought through much more of it, but Yeah, I appreciate the question. I actually, again, I'll, I'll speak just from the perspective of our work in Tanzania. I, I actually see the three as, as complementary, and I'll use the example of the Wazazini Pendeni project, which it is. Um, however, it's on the Text to Change platform, which it is, but so is FHI 360's program, and so are several others uh, working with Monza Bore Nutrition Program and uh, breastfeeding and early childhood stunting. So. What we've seen is that we've taken a, a project to scale, but we're also building within a country the scaling of a particular platform. But I think what's most important for us and what we're really, really hoping it happens is that by being able to demonstrate both to the government, um, any skeptics that were in Tanzania that were not the initial government supporters of this, as well as the telecommunications companies and the regulatory authorities, you know, 20,000 active participants in 13 days is significant. But there's 1.8 million births a year in Tanzania, so we have a long way to go. But what we've been able to prove already is that there's demand for this information and we can achieve volume. And I think that this could have an important shift then in looking specifically at strategy and that governments, not only within the Ministry of Health, but potentially in agriculture and, and others, can start to change that strategy and see that this actually is an effective uh, communications tool and behavior change communication tool. Um. This is all going too nice. So I will say no, it's not possible. Um, and it has one big reason, and that's the fact that the majority of M health campaigns that we just discussed for the last uh, 45 minutes is basically based on grants. So it's dependent on whether or not the grant makers are issuing us to, um, to collaborate, and they're not. They're pushing us to compete, compete on platforms, compete on scale, compete on ambition. So if the donors, the big donors, everybody that's funding on the back are, uh, uh, on our campaigns are not pushing us towards collaboration, this will not happen. Thank you for that. And um, I'll open it up now at this point. So if you wouldn't mind coming to the microphone and 
uh, just saying your, your name and who you're affiliated with and then asking your question. Um, if I could ask people to keep them concise, uh, that would be fantastic. Merrick? Merrick Schaefer, uh, the World Bank. Um, I'm currently writing a white paper with some colleagues from UNICEF on a project that's scaled by itself, meaning without the ICT for D community, the M Health community in Nigeria, uh, tracking 7 million children being registered and being given birth certificates. Um, and we were really trying to look at what enabling ecosystem allowed this to happen. And uh, there was a platform in place, there was a free short code, there was um, uh, local software developers to do it, but it really seemed like it was the government's uh, drive and push. The head of a ministry made it happen. I'd love to hear the panelists' thoughts on how do we convince ministries to really take a leadership and push this agenda forward and say we want it scaled, we want it scaled now. Yeah, I, I, again, I think um, if, I, if I may speak just for my close work with the ministry in Tanzania is that they're less focused on the actual technology intervention and they're really focused on the public health impact. And by framing the discussion and going to the ministry and saying we understand that you have a significant chance of, you know, of basically one in six in Tanzania of dying as a woman delivering in Tanzania because we have less than 50% of people delivering in the health facilities. And you say we have a way that we can help to, to address this and we can bring down the maternal mortality. Um, that we start to see that there's more buy-in. Um, there's not is enough yet information known around M Health. Um, there's massive gaps, in particular in the developing countries, around ICT, um, and even understanding the concept that is M Health. But what we found is, if you start with what you can help address, and what is that public health problem, then again, we've we've seen that there's more openness to to looking at different technology solutions. Hi, I'm David Elward from Ashoka. Nice to see so many friends, and thank you for the good panel. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest problems that we've run into in scaling is that, uh, to pick up on what Hayo said, uh, the funding sources aren't looking for scaling. They're not looking f because they're not looking at systems. They're looking for innovations. Uh, and they're very interested if you've got a really cool new thing in funding you, perhaps. But if you say w there's this system called, and it needs to be built around women and giving women the capacity to create successful babies, so it's got all these different complicated pieces to it, their eyes go down, they can't deal with it. Uh, so, uh, uh, and full stop. Second, 80% of the money that's funding healthcare in the developing world is private money. So, you know, we all talk about grants, we all kind of live on grants, but in fact, the funding source to make change happen that's consumer friendly is, is, is business. And third, it's a collection of players coming together or usually to make money. How, are you exploring entrepreneurial models that are ecosystem models, not individual innovation models? <laughs> All right, I'll answer your day. <laughs> For all time's sake. Um, no, and I, I, I agree fully. Um, um, it's um, it's a, it's a, it's 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 not it's a bit self-fulfilling. I mean, you're if you start an M Health campaign and with all the partnerships and with the donors uh, um, uh, in your back, it's always very difficult to keep your eye on the ball. You're you're just you're just looking at what you're doing and, and you're not looking at the end goal. So I agree that if uh, a lot of the M Health uh, implementing organizations such as, uh, such as ours uh, would look more into building on, on the ecosystem and not on innovation, uh, that would improve scale. So it's, uh, it's good feedback. Um, it's something we should work on and uh, sometimes we're not being given the time to work on that because of the, of the push on the need to innovate, the need to be a front runner. Uh, but I agree, and maybe it's time also in this hype, hype cycle, uh, Garrett also talked about, um, that this maybe next year is time to reflect and to just to say, well, we should build on this. Let's stop with small grants on innovation. Uh, let's just go on, on ecosystem and collaboration on, the, on a regional level, not even country level, but just let's do this part of Africa or whatever. And uh, you only need a couple of organizations, not a partnership of 15. You need four or five, and then you're up to scale. So I agree, it's, uh, it's good feedback for a lot of us uh, out there. Yeah, I just want to want to add um, sort of two things, uh, David, that, that you brought up. Um, I mean, one around the, the donors and sort of donors not necessarily working together, the competition. Again, I think that 
as implementers, we do need to work with, with the partners and with the donors um, and push back. And I saw Adam was in here earlier with USAID. But we have been working. We get CDC funding. We've been working with President's Malaria Initiative, as I mentioned, GIZ, formerly GTZ, as well as with USAID funding. And it's not easy. It's not easy, but it can be done. And we've been able to achieve um, national scale systems only because the donor agencies have been willing to work together. And I think that given, given the economic times and people looking at PEPFAR and a variety of other uh, considerations um, you know, in the global economy, I think there is a lot more willingness, and this is the right time for us as implementers to actually have those discussions with donors. And again, um, I think having very clear agreements and roles and responsibilities laid out from the beginning, there can be collaboration that can work together. David Wilcox, Reach Scale. Um, I, I'll just follow on David's comment by su uh, suggesting that th there seems uh, there seems to be an under recognition on our parts the extent to which we program the way everybody thinks about this, and and this is going to sound like a really cheap shot, but the fact that you had project platform and strategy, but didn't say business. I think is an example of that way that we're programmed to think about it in that way. And in a sense, if you don't start out with kind of the Ashoka social enterprise view of the world, that's where you end up. But if you step back to that social enterprise view, it adds a whole bunch of models to the discussion that are ignored if you don't put them in at the front end and once they're ignored, they're not available. So the question, in essence, is how can we step back, pull in those other models, in many cases from small organizations working on the ground who could benefit enormously from these kinds of campaigns, but the campaigns aren't connected to them, and their ability to deliver on the campaigns isn't connected. So the campaign happens, but it's not integrated, and therefore you don't actually get the outcomes. And we have a lot of good Davids here in the room. Um, no, it, it's, it's um, business. It's also what, what we're doing. I mean, we're adding value, essentially, um, through uh, implementing uh, M Health campaigns. Uh, but who's paying for those services? It's, it's one of the final slides of Gareth as well about who's paying actually for these services. So if you would include the end user, the people that really receive the messages and, uh, and have them as a paying customer, that's including a social business model, um, that would change a lot. The general assumption still is, it's the insight that, that it's out there, that Africa is not ready there. I mean, the general assumption is that people are not willing to pay for healthcare information services on their mobile uh, because they, they lack the, the, the money to do that. So therefore, the donors are paying for zero-rated shortcodes, toll-free shortcodes, to come in and to provide those services. So that's absolutely an uh, interesting model to look at it, um, to include the, the end user of M Health campaigns as a paying customer in this. Um, Africa could be ready for that. Um, so I, I actually, uh, business was in, in, the, in the slides, but um, just to note, um, actually a number of the projects that we work with, I mean, they, they all had to come with a, a nascent business model in place, or at least had presented that. Um, they've all been struggling to try to figure out what the, what the business model is that will give them uh, the legs to gain scale. And uh, a number of them have um, attempted and in some cases have, have had some success in partnering with the private sector or, or using a model where there is a um, um, the, the population in the urban areas pays for the service, but those in the rural areas don't, sort of a Robin Hood approach. There's, there's a range of different models, and I, I'm, I'm not sure that um, uh, we've only been at this for about five months, um, and so I think it would be really valuable to have that conversation with you or others in the room who have that expertise or that experience in, in other diverse models that, that might be relevant here. So um, that would be great. Yeah, again, um, I think, was it Gerald? Uh, I appreciate the, the question. I think it's a really important point um, to, to raise. Um, but I think it's just a general question that's sensitive the world over around people making money around health. 
uh, making money around social welfare. So I think it, it starts out as a sensitive topic to begin with. And what we found in Tanzania is that approaching with the private sector there right from the beginning saying we're here to make money, we want to solve a problem but we're here to make money, um, it actually was a lot more difficult. But, but to your point, it is something we're very actively pursuing with the telecommunications companies in particular along with other private sector actors. Um, we've started with SMS messaging for Wazazi Nipendeni. However, these messages will now be available for free. The telecoms, we hope, will be putting these on their USSD and making these available for free for their users to pull the data. But guess what? They get to then know, is this a man, is this a woman? And they get to start to send them information about agriculture and start to do their premium services. Maybe they want a weather report as a farmer, for example. So we do see that there are offshoots where the base product, that core information, doesn't necessarily in and of itself need to be profitable, but we're looking more at a bundling where we can make the business case and show that they can upsell um, or potentially create new markets uh, and retain customers. And, and also, I think, looking at bundling with the mobile money component, taking a little bit of pressure off of mHealth on its own to be profitable, but looking at the broader ecosystem, as, as we're using the word today, and looking at what broader way with the telecoms and mobile money in general. So looking with the Ministry of Health, maybe pay, uh, patient payments, for example. Maybe telecoms would be willing to do a very low-rated uh, free public service, you know, in this respect, but they can recoup the cost in another way. Again, that, that was a point that I made, is that they do need to be profitable. I agree with you, but we don't necessarily need to, to monetize or, or, or profitize, if that's a word, every single component of mHealth necessarily. Um, and lastly, again, around consumer demand and the willingness to pay, it would be interesting. I think there's some mama side sessions because they're charging in Bangladesh uh, for the SMS messages, and I understand it's a very successful program and that incredibly uh, poor people are paying. So, again, I think that, that we can educate ourselves at this conference and learn more. Thanks, sir. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Arian Terrell. I'm here with MedWeb and the International Synergy Group. Um, thanks for all your presentations. I was really interested in the Tanzania pilot. Um, my organization has been working for some time now to launch um, a similar kind of program in eastern Afghanistan using the MAMA messages. The challenge that um, we ran into rather quick was that, um, uh, lo and behold, the people who are in need of the messages the most um, are often those uh, where the literacy rates are the lowest. And so um, what we ended up with was actually getting um, pointed a lot more towards the direction of interactive voice response, and almost like robocalling kinds of things. So I guess my question uh, for you guys, um, especially Sarah and the gentleman working on Text for Change was, um, in your pilots and your programs, have you run up against or began to run up against, I guess, the limitations of SMS so far? Um, uh, what, what are you guys doing to deal with that kind of stuff, and where do you see that kind of thing going? Um, yeah, we run into that on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, we started as text to change as a, um, as a as a pilot, as a program in 2008, only working on text messages. And uh, well, at this point, I um, uh, I can say that the majority of our programs is still text message based, but a lot is with IVR, interactive voice response systems. Very expensive, m even more difficult to scale than text message campaigns, and and some others are, are basically go back to face-to-face -face interventions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mix. A uh, mix also with radio, what Sarah stressed out on how to uh, sensitize people about it. We never use text messages as a single uh, uh, way of me messaging people. It's always in combination with other media, radio, voice, um, and that, that's the success of, uh, of a campaign as well. So yes, uh, uh, literate, uh, uh, literacy is a, is a big problem. We even uh, dropped out of a big uh, program uh, funded by DFID and Sierra Leone. Um, because we couldn't see any added value from us as an organization there because they were focused on, on setting up text message campaign there and uh, we truly saw after a couple of uh, visits uh, that there was absolutely nobody able to read the messages. So yeah, you have to be honest at some point and say, well, let's go to either to IVR or just get on your bike and go into the village. I just want to briefly add to that. Um, I think there are a lot of limitations of SMS, and it's not the literacy alone, um, but I won't go into the details now. But specifically on the literacy issue, um, part of why we've created a partner track of messages, so it's not just messages for women, is specifically because of some of the literacy challenges. So there are messages designed in third person in case it's the sister or the mother or the relative or the husband who can read those messages. And in our extensive pretesting, in particular in the rural areas, without our prompting, uh, people were reading one another the messages. And even at our launch event, we had women who wanted to come on stage as these 
ground supporters of the program, and we said, okay, great, everyone get out their phones. You're going to show the crowd how to register. They said, well, we don't have phones. And we said, how, you know, and they said, oh, no, but our, our, our partners, our sister, my friend, um, are reading them the messages, and there's a lot of interest. And in particular, that's why we created the information track of messages, um, not just for those who are currently pregnant, but also just as, as a general uh, community sensitization. So, again, I think it's an important point, and we are looking at the IBR and the um, USSD as well. I think we're almost out of time, so if, if both of you could just ask your question, and then we'll have the panel respond to both at the same time, that would be great. Do you want to start in the front? Okay. Um, I am Willow Pequinot. I work at NIH, and we fund research grants, as you know. And innovation is necessary, but it's no longer sufficient. In the last 20 years, NIH has begun to see that their responsibility doesn't end with the conclusion of the grant that they need to participate in the scaling up. And grants that don't, that don't have the feasibility for scaling up will not get a good score because the scores are now innovation slash impact. And if there's no chance, it'll have impact. I, I was glad to see in the last few exchanges there was messaging because the technology is only as good as the messages. And I'm wondering how you go about continuing to evaluate and test online whether your messages are having uh, the desired effect. Thanks so much. And if we could just ask you to ask the question in the back as well. So one question on evaluation and how that's done. And go ahead. Um, hi, so I'm Kelly Langle from FHI 360, and so first just wanted to say um, thanks for kind of the shout outs around collaboration, um, specifically in Tanzania, since that's what um, Sarah is mostly talking about with Text to Change. So uh, I wanted to just say two things. So, first of all, I really feel like um, the issue of collaboration among our donor funded projects is important, and I think that it behooves us in the M Health kind of global community to really do our homework and to really know what other people are doing on the ground such that we're not redundant and we're really complementing and supporting and working very closely with governments and MOHs and all of our donors and that in that we really can step up and really positively support those collaborations and we do have a couple of excellent examples around that. When we were first starting to um, think about implementing um, the program I lead at FHI, MFRH, we talked to everyone we knew in the field, um, and we had a number of partners say, oh, since y'all are thinking about doing this in your research, you're funded to do M4H, we're not going to do something that we've been thinking about that's like it because you're going to do it. Let's go ahead and collaborate. And so we've always had that collaborative model, and so I think that we really, uh, at, the, at the ground level, we can force those collaborations. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say is that, and Sarah, you said this, but I just wanted to echo that. Yes, the, the, the business model or the social enterprise model for these campaigns where essentially we're using, in one aspect, we're using mobile phones to amplify the reach of our health information to targeted users, general public, health workers, whoever it may be. And we're often reaching the underserved. We have examples of that from a lot of our different of our mobile phone programs. And so I think Sometimes you need that government, you need donors, you, you need to have these programs externally funded. And I just want to, sometimes I get frustrated with this conversation because it's okay to have that donor and government funding. It doesn't always have to, there doesn't always have to be a business case. And so I just wanted to say that because sometimes I feel like we're, we're, we're put out, we're constantly said, well, you know, why can't you get your users to pay for your system or why don't you get the telecoms to support it and things like that. And so I think that's an important conversation. But I also just want to acknowledge that not, not everything that we do needs to be done that way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those comments. And let me just turn it back to the panel for any final responses or reflections as we come to the close of our session. Garrett? Um, it's interesting. I, I, I had a similar experience where there was um, uh, a set of wonderful uh, technologists in the room, and um, we knew that we were getting a project that was related to uh, a technology, but we, we, in some way, we thought of ourselves as competitors, um, and we had the opportunity to sit down with the technologists um, 
and a number of different ones. And we asked, what is your strategy? And where are you going for with that technology? And what can we do um, that you're not going to do that would strengthen what you're, you want? And, and so um, it, was a, it was an interesting conversation. It was very early in uh, our uh, development of, of the solution in India. And, um, but it led, I think, to fostering, um, uh, you know, we, we were able to, to extend the use of our own grant much further because we knew what we didn't have to build. And I know it's, it, it, it was a, a genuine collaboration in that way, and, um, and it, it helped us in the end. So, but it's really tough. You gotta, you've got to approach those projects uh, or the technologists early on uh, and just say, I, I think you guys are doing a great job, or we could strengthen you in that way, and can you help us in that way, and, and have that conversation. But, um, yeah. Yeah, just briefly, uh, reply. Uh, to the comments and the question the same. Um, in looking at our collaboration with Elizabeth Glacier Pediatric AIDS Foundation, as well as with the Joining Hands Initiative, which is CETA funded, uh, and with the Aga Khan Health Services, which is a, a private institution, um, what we've been able to do in both cases, those organizations did find out about us through the community of practice, and they were able to not need to invest, even though they had M Health funding as part of their budgets, because M Health seems to be this thing that people just keep throwing into their, their budgets, but they're not quite sure what they're going to do. And a few years down the road, they say, hey, we're supposed to do something with this M Health. So we were able to leverage the existing platform um, so that they did not need to add yet another SMS uh, message-based program out into the field, the same way as we leveraged the FHI 360 family planning messages, rather than recreating that and doing that uh, in addition. But what it allowed us on the, on the evaluation side is in the future, after we get uh, all the approvals to do, actually do the research, um, we'll have those, those folks in the facilities. We, it would have been incredibly difficult for us to actually have boots on the ground in these facilities. EGPAF is in more than 1,000 uh, PMTCT sites. So this has incredible potential in that respect to actually see what impact is this actually having on the ground in these districts, in these facilities. Um, so we will have rich data, but that only will be possible through these partnerships. Yeah, now to conclude, I think still coming back to one of my, my earlier stuff I said, it's, it's still on, on ambition. I mean, we will see in the end, in one or two years from now, that, uh, that the ambitious campaigns will scale. Uh, they will scale with or without a business model. Um, because sometimes, as Kelly uh, uh, said well, it's, uh, they're not every mobile health campaign should have a business model. But if you're really ambitious, I mean, in the end, you will figure out what the business model is. The problem was, uh, for the last couple of years, there was no clear view on any business model. And I've seen well, that changed a bit over the last two years or so. So I think we can actually move forward to that, and you will see results in one or two years from now, uh, definitely. Um, and the ML field will, will get a little bit uh, tinier. I mean, a lot of organizations that uh, are working without business models or without the ambition to scale, um, they will not be here anymore at the ML Summit. But you will see ambition, you will see scale uh, with or without business models. I just wanted to take a minute to thank each of our panelists. I think this has been a great discussion, and thanks to the audience for your provocative and, and lively questions as well. Um, we're over time at this point, so if you could all join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists.